So Romans chapter 15 will be in verses 8 through 13. So Romans chapter 15, starting at verse number 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ, or Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God, to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, as it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, he saith, saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that ye may abound in hope and through the power of the Holy Ghost. Father, we do thank you again for the day that you've given us, Lord. Thank you for an opportunity to be gathered together. I do thank you for the songs that have been sung that reminds us of your love, your goodness, and your faithfulness, and the grace and mercy that you bestow upon us each and every day. Father, I do ask that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. We don't want to go through an hour in vain, Father, not hearing from heaven, not being challenged by your word, not being guided by your spirit. And Father, help us to even respond to your leading in our life, just as Paul responded to your leading in his life on the road to Damascus. As his life was on the road to destruction, yet you stopped him in his tracks. You showed him grace and mercy. You turned his life around. You showed him that he had value. You showed him he had purpose. And Father, thank you for the lessons we learn in the life of Paul. But Father, thank you for the lessons that we learn in our own life. That Father, we are valued in your eyes. We're valued with the price of blood the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for our sins. Lord, the fact that you have reconciled us unto yourself, that you were in Jesus Christ reconciling the world unto yourself, that, Father, you have redeemed us, you've bought us back from from, uh, the bondage of sin, you've given us freedom in Christ, freedom to follow you, freedom to trust you, freedom to believe in you. And, Father, we do thank you for all the things you do in our life. And, Father, thank you. Again, for this hour that you've given us, we ask that you'd bless it. We ask that you'd be glorified in it, and we would be made stronger in our faith in Christ, for it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. This morning I want to talk to us about the source of hope. The source of hope. Many people are hoping in a better tomorrow. Many people are hoping in a better government, in a better job, in a better relationship, in a better vehicle. We put hope in a lot of different things in this world, but the hope of the Bible is not the hope of maybe it'll change, maybe it'll get better, but our hope is based in the one who's been faithful, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the one that we know holds our life in the palm of his hand, the one we know according to his faithful word has prepared a place for us, and he is coming again to receive us unto him, and while we wait for his return, he's faithful to guide us each and every day of our life and to be our joy, to be our strength, to give us grace each and every day to face another day that maybe we don't want to face. And through the scriptures this morning, we're going to see just who it is that is the source of our hope and how to abound in that hope. Because you know what it's like to get your hopes up for something and then it falls apart, it doesn't come to pass and you're disappointed and then you're, you're tempted the next time really not to hope in that again because of just the bad experience that you had. That never happens with God because God's always faithful. God is always on time because he works according to his timetable, not our timetable. And when God comes through, It does bring joy, it brings peace, and it reminds us of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I want you to look, if you would, just at verse 13. Because verse 13 of Romans 15 says, Now the God of hope. God is the source of true hope. Again, I can hope that my car doesn't break down again, but that's 
all depending on if the car is going to break down. I mean, cars break down. I can hope I don't get a flat tire, but you know what? If the tires on my car are getting bald and getting to the point there's no more tread, then I'm probably going to get a flat tire at some point. There might be a nail in the road. I mean, I can hope and be disappointed at different times, but when God, when Jesus Christ is the source of our hope, we're never disappointed. The hope that we have in Christ always gives us the strength we need to face another day because we know who's going to walk with us through that day. We know who will bring us through the trials we face because it is the Lord who is always faithful. He always has our resources. Our God shall supply our every need. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, as Paul writes to encourage a young man in his faith, he says in his letter as he addresses Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Which is our hope. Again, I can hope all I want that the job I work will recognize my hard work and give me a pay raise or give me more time off, but why not hope in the one who can change the heart of a king as the rivers of water and turn it with us wherever he will. God moves in the hearts of man. God moves in the situations of our life, and God is the one that is always faithful. Our hope can either be disappointed or it can be encouraged in the one who is always faithful to us. And Jesus Christ is faithful. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 reminds us, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. It is Jesus Christ. Now, we know that Jesus Christ took our place on the cross of Calvary. We know he took our pain upon him. We know he even experienced separation from the Heavenly Father for a time for us so we wouldn't have to. Jesus said that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. And the joy that was set before him was not the crucifixion. It was not the torture he would go through. It was not the rejection he would experience, but the fact that after that, he would be back at the right hand of the Father. I mean, he was born to die for us. He came to fulfill the Father's will, but when he was faced with that cross, he looked beyond the cross to see that he'd be seated back at the right hand of the Father. He looked beyond the cross seeing the sins of the world would be paid for. He looked beyond the cross to see that your life would be changed by the power of God, that you and I could live a life with him by faith and endure things that we face in life knowing that we have the power of God not just in our life, but in us, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior this morning, you have what verse 13 talks about, the power of the Holy Ghost in you. You and I have the power to overcome situations, to overcome distresses, to overcome doubts and fears and failures, because the Holy Spirit of God in us reminds us of the victory that we have through Jesus Christ. Again, salvation gives us that hope. There's neither salvation in, uh, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And because if we have that hope in salvation, it gives us the hope that, you know what? You think about the worst day you've had in your life. Now, we don't like to remind ourselves of the worst day, but think about the worst day of your life. It could have been worse. In our mind, at different times, you think, how can it get any worse than this? If you and I don't know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, it does get worse. There is a separation from a loving Heavenly Father. That's why God sent his only begotten son into the world to live a perfect sinless life that we cannot live so that we don't have to experience the separation of God once we die, once we pass from this life to the next. God sent Christ 
to take our place on the cross so that you and I could have a life of joy, a life of peace, because we are trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We're trusting in the finished work of Christ at the cross of Calvary. And the Bible reminds us that he that hath begun a good work in you will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ when he returns. If you have the gift of salvation, you have something that brings you hope. Not hope, I hope I do get to go to heaven. I hope I find grace in the eyes of God. But it's a hope that is, it is, it's confident. It's a confident hope. I know it will never change. No matter what happens in life, I'm not going to stand before the Lord and hear him say, depart from me thou that workest iniquity, because I put my faith in his finished work. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. You remember a day in your life when you had no hope? You, had no, you didn't know why you were born? Had someone uh, ask this question yesterday to me. They, they wanted me to think about it. But they said, you know, why, why were we born? Why are we here? Why didn't God just skip this life and just have us come right to heaven? Why do we have to live through the life we're living? Why do we have to experience the good times, the bad times, the, the joyous times, the sad times. Why do we have to do that? Do you realize that God is sovereign in all that he, in all that he does? Do you realize he even knew Adam and Eve would sin in the Garden of Eden? He made Adam. He created Adam, gave Adam life, created Eve from a, from a rib of Adam. He put them in a beautiful, perfect place, sinless. There was no sin when God created Adam and Eve. But one day, they chose to sin against what God had said. God said, do not eat the tree of the knowledge of evil and good. Don't eat that fruit. You can have everything else but that one tree. Do not eat the fruit of it. But they chose on a day because as they were tempted by their adversary to think about what God said and to choose, ah, is my way better or is God's way better? And they chose to eat the forbidden fruit. Sin entered into the world and death by sin. God, even though he knew, he gave them a choice. Because you know what? He wants us to choose to love him. He wants us to choose to walk with him. He wants us to choose to believe that he is a God of forgiveness. He is a God of grace. He's a God of love. And he has prepared a place for us in heaven. Jesus said that in his father's house were many mansions. If it were not so, he would have told you. Again, God wanted us to experience life with him. But the Bible also says no one goes to heaven without being born once and then being born a second time. Everyone's born into the world once. Everyone's born Everyone lives life, but it's the second birth that is the most important, the second birth through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is who regenerates. The Holy Spirit is who changes a life. If you were to take your Bibles and go to Titus chapter 3, <clears throat> Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5. Believe me, there has been many times in my life where I thought, Lord, it would have been better if you just allowed me to be in heaven and not have to go through this life and make wrong decisions in my life. But that's the beauty of life. We learn that life isn't worth living without the love and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. We learn that we can live life through the power of Jesus Christ. And it's a wonderful thing to be forgiven by God. To know that you messed up in life, to know that maybe you went wayward in a time in your life and the Lord drew you back to Him and you find love and forgiveness with your Heavenly Father. I remember myself growing up in church as a little boy, but when I became a teenager, uh, family difficulties and things, I was given a choice. 
go to church or not go to church anymore, and I didn't go. I chose to live a separate life than what I had been taught. And it was later on in my early 20s that the Lord, again, he allowed me to go for a while. He allowed me to get to the end of myself. He allowed me to get sick of myself. And then one night, with a loving wife speaking to me, those words that really got my attention and me crying out to the Lord and asking the Lord to forgive me, come into my heart and to save me. And I just remember just the peace I had, a peace I had never experienced before. Because you can find temporary peace in the things of the world, but there is something very significant about the peace of God that rules in your heart. It helps you to know that you are loved. It helps you to know that you are forgiven. It helps you to know that you are accepted. It helps you know that God truly does care about you and about your life. And just living life after that, ups and downs, yet never having God forsake me, stop loving me, or cast me aside because of the mistakes I would continue to make. We're not perfect, but yet we have a Lord who is watching over us. We have a Savior who walks with us and helps us through this life and reminds us of the hope that we have in Him. In Titus chapter 3, verse 5, you're there. It says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy. He saved us by His mercy, not of anything we did, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. If you are born again, if you know Christ is your Savior, you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, helping you to live life, helping you to make the right decisions, helping you to be able to sing and to have joy in your heart even at a midnight hour when things are dark and bleak because your hope is in the one who is always faithful, the one who's always watching over you, the one who's always guiding you, the one who always has your best interest in mind because God said that he has thoughts of peace towards you and not of evil to give you an expected end. And that expected end is always by his side. It's always looking into his face. It's always finding joy in the presence of the Lord. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You and I have a lively hope this morning because our Lord and Savior is alive. Yes, he was crucified, beaten beyond recognition. We read that in scripture. They hung him on a cross. His enemies thought they had gotten rid of him. Our adversary, the devil, thought he had gotten victory over the Son of God. Yet three days later, the Son of God rose from that grave because you cannot keep the giver of life in the grave. He died in our place and rose to prove who he was, that he is God, and he gives life to every single person that will come unto him. Because he said, the thief cometh not but to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give life and to give it more abundantly. You and I can have more life than we have today. We can have more life. We can feel more alive in Christ. We can have more joy and more peace. And we can, we can by faith see the path that's laid before us that God wants us to walk with him because it's a path of faithfulness. It's a path of joy and peace. It's a path that will help us grow closer to the Lord, to experience the goodness of God, to experience the faith, faithfulness of God, the mercy of God, and experience His love. When you think about just hope, how can I abound in this hope? Because every day is a different day. I have no idea what I'm going to face this week. I mean, I know what my schedule is for this week. I, I've got some ideas of what I'm going to do, but we understand if you've lived life long enough, Things just happen without you expecting it. And you're, sometimes you're caught off guard and you don't know what am I to do. And you find yourself, even at times, not having any hope in the situation. 
Yet you and I can abound in the hope of Jesus Christ regardless of what we face or might face because our hope abounds in Jesus Christ, not in the what-ifs or not in the circumstance being changed. In Romans chapter 5, in verse 1 and 2, the Bible says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. You and I stand in the grace of Christ and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I may not know the answer to everything, but I know someone who does. I may not know the future, but I know someone who does. Now, I would like it if God would, would always tell me my future and tell me what may be tomorrow so I can avoid it. Sometimes, you know, we, Lord, if you just let me see my entire life and I'll be okay. But if you're anything like me, if God were to show me my entire life, the good and the bad, I probably would have walked the other way and said, never mind, <laughs> I'm going this way. That's what Jonah did. God wanted Jonah to go in a certain direction, and Jonah did not want to go where God wanted him to go, and he went the opposite direction. But in the opposite direction, he did find the mercy and grace and love of God. After spending three days and three nights without God speaking, without the comfort and peace of God, because he had to get to the end of himself, he had to realize, you know what? It is better to walk God's path instead of my path. It is better to hope in the Lord who's faithful and knows everything and, and sees the beginning to the end and can guide me according to his will. Again, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Jeremiah said, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is. I've put my trust and hope in a lot of people in my lifetime. And many of them have failed me. I've put my hope and trust in different jobs, and those jobs have failed me. I've put my hope and trust in, in different things that people, hey, this will work. If you do this, this will work. And, and I did it, and it's like, it didn't work for me. Why is it when someone says, hey, do this and it'll work, why is it it never works? I realize for myself as a Christian, as a child of God, that I am supposed to be seeking God and what His will is and what His answer is. Even if, even if, and here's the temptation of not trusting God, what if you've already been down that road once before and you know what to do because it worked out good the last time? God still wants us to trust Him. God still wants us to seek Him because we're not guaranteed every time will be the same. We're not guaranteed all the outcome will be the same. Our hope is to be found in Jesus Christ who never changes, who never fails. We are to abound in the hope that my hope is placed in the one who sees me, knows me, guides me, and has a purpose for my life. And that purpose is always to get closer to God. It's always to feel His presence, to be filled with His joy and His peace. It's always for us to realize I'm better off walking with the Lord instead of walking alone. First Thessalonians in verse 4, or chapter 4 says this, When our loved ones die in the Lord, we have sorrow, but not like the world. I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, because there's things in this world that people sorrow after. I've, I have lost many, I say lost, many loved ones have gone on before me. You have those special people that are close, near and dear to your heart. Do you realize if they know the Lord... You'll see them again one day. And, and Paul, as he writes to the church at Thessalonica, wants to encourage them because they all thought those that had passed on before the second coming of Christ would miss out on the second coming of Christ. And he wrote to them to encourage them, 
if they're, if they're asleep in Christ, if they know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they're not going to miss out on the coming of the Lord. When you look at chapter 4 and look at verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. I love that word asleep. There are those that believe once you die, that's it. There's nothing else. That's not true. God plainly shows us in Scripture that there is life after death. And for the believer, for the child of God, he calls it sleep. You know what it's like to go to sleep at night. You just assume you're going to wake up the next morning. You, you, you look forward to the next day, and when you wake up, it's like it's a new day. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we close our eyes on this side of heaven to open them up on the other side? All the pain, all the stress of life, everything we dread, the physical, cancer, all the sicknesses, all that will be changed. We had someone recently pass on just, just about a week ago, a week and a half ago. She had been battling cancer, cancer, and she passed on. No longer battling cancer. Now she has her glorified body. Now she is in the presence of the Lord. Never to sorrow again. Never to have a, another bad day in life. A husband was left behind. You understand when a loved one goes on and you're left behind, you have those emotions of missing that person and, and wanting to see them again and wanting to talk with them and, and walk with them and all the things you did with them in life. But the husband knows that one day he'll see her again. One day he'll be in the presence of the Lord. And that's, that's the hope that we have. We don't sorrow at the passing of somebody that knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior because we know we'll see them again. But what if it's not the death of a loved one? What if it's, again, just it's life, things happen? Sometimes you're diagnosed with cancer. What do you do with it? I've not, I've not been diagnosed with cancer. I've had loved ones that have been diagnosed with different diseases. I've had my own health issues. But I've found that God's always faithful. And though when something bad happens, especially when it's a health issue, there's a temptation to get mad at God. Well, God, I'm trying to live for you. I'm trying to do what's right. Why are you allowing this to happen? Paul had that same question. Because the Bible says that God allowed what was called a thorn in the flesh in Paul's life. Now, Paul, you read scripture, and Paul was a great man of God. He was someone who was killing Christians at first, wrecking havoc of the church. But his life got turned around by Jesus Christ, and he became a great, a great proponent. He became a great leader of the church. He became someone who loved the Lord and would hazard his life for other believers. Yet when he had this thorn in the flesh, something that he, he considered the Satan or the messenger of Satan to buffet him, he asked the Lord three times to remove it. And he was a man of faith, a man of prayer. He was someone whose prayers could move mountains and, and move hearts. It wasn't because of him, but the power of God upon his life. But he asked the Lord to change something in his life that was bothering him. Something that seemed to be keeping him from doing more. You ever had that thought, If Lord, if you did this for me, I could do so much more for you. But Lord, if you change this, this situation in my life, then Lord, I could really give more effort to the things you want me to. And you would think that God would say, you know what, I do. I want you to do more for me. I want you to give more. So you know what, I'm going to give you better health. I'm going to give you better wealth. I'm going to do all this for you so you can do so much more for me. But that's not the case. Because more than our service, more than us being wealthy, more than what we can do for the Lord, He wants us to experience His grace. And that's what Paul was told by Jesus Christ. My grace is sufficient for thee. Because in your weakness, I'm strong. 
And Paul did not get the answer he was praying for. But he got the answer God wanted him to have, and he submitted to that answer. And he said, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon my life. And I believe, I was even talking to the Sunday school class this morning, that personally I've never rejoiced in my iniquities or my my uh, my infirmities. I've never said, oh, yes, Lord, another day of, of bad news, another day of struggle, yes. But as I thought more about it, Paul is not really saying he's going to rejoice in, you read, it, you read his autobiography, stone left for dead, snake bitten, shipwrecked, beaten in a prison cell. But what he rejoices in is the power of God upon his life. He rejoices in the grace of God because he's a child of God. He knows that God never will do anything wrong. God will never do anything wrong. God always does right. He loves his children. And if the thorn in the flesh will keep us closer to him, then that's what God allows so that we will rely upon him so that we will seek Him with all of our heart and trust Him. Because in Proverbs, excuse me, in Proverbs chapter 3, when you look at verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thy own understanding. But we want to understand. We want to know what's going to happen. We want to know how, what's the outcome? What can I do to get myself through this? But God says, Trust not in yourself. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. That is abounding in our hope in Christ, knowing he knows where I'm at, he knows where he wants to take me, and I can trust him all along the way, and my hope is in the one who never fails me, the one who who is always watching over me and has my best interest in mind. I want you to notice, though, <clears throat> back in Romans, I want you to notice, though, how, how are we able to abound in this hope? How can we remain steadfast in our hope in the Lord? Because it's attacked all the time. Again, just different things happen that causes us to lose focus and causes us to to lose hope at different times and causes us to even start to question what God is doing in our life. God understands that our emotions are not perfect. He understands that we're not perfect. That's why he died for us. That's why he loves us because he can be perfect in our life His power in our life can help us to overcome our own frailty, can help us to overcome our own weaknesses. We never want to deceive ourselves and say, I'm strong enough. I've been saved long enough. I've realized, I've come to to learn by experience, I'll never reach that plateau of perfection until I see Christ face to face. He wants me just to trust Him to rely upon Him, to walk with Him and talk with Him and to be honest with Him. Lord, I'm struggling. There's a father in Scripture that I can relate to. His son was being tormented, tormented by a demon. He was being thrown into the fire. He was being thrown into the water. His life was out of control. His father couldn't do anything. You ever felt helpless that you wanted to help somebody? It It was out of your power. You just Everything you did, it just didn't help. And this father comes to Jesus and says, if you can do anything, help my son. And Jesus asked the father, do you believe? The father said, yes, I believe. But then he said something that caught the Savior's attention and actually got his son the help he needed. The father said, I believe, but help mine unbelief. I know God can, but I'll admit there's times I struggle with, Lord, I don't know if you will for me. Lord, I know that you have done it for so-and-so, but Lord, I feel unworthy. If we're honest with God, 
then God can work in our life. God can do something. God can't do something in someone's life if they're not honest with him and if we're not honest with ourselves. Lord, I need your help. Lord, I can't do this. Lord, I need you to help me through this. And that's why he's given us of his spirit. Notice in verse 13, he says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Everybody wants joy in their life. Everybody wants peace in their life. We don't like the constant struggles. We don't like the constant battles in life, the roller coaster rides. We want the joy and the peace. And now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope. And the way we abound in hope is through the power of the Holy Ghost. Through the power of the Holy Ghost. It's not something mystical. It's not something I have to go seek after. I don't have to go to somebody, hey, will you give me the power of the Holy Spirit? There's a man listed in Scripture that saw Peter and saw the power that Peter had and wanted to give Peter money to have that same power. You can't buy the power of God. The power of the Holy Spirit comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. The moment someone confesses to God that they're a sinner in need of a Savior and calls upon the Lord to come into their life and to save them, the Holy Spirit of God comes into their life and seals them, comes into their life and helps them to live that new life in Christ. That's why the Bible says, tells us, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. I can't live a life that God wants me to live without the power of the Holy Spirit. I cannot resist the temptations of life, whether it's doubting, whether it's unbelief. I can't resist any of those without the Holy Spirit in me, helping me to walk in the ways of the Lord. To abound in the hope of God can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit, through submitting my life to walking with the Lord. The Bible says, walk in the Spirit that you might not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's really allowing God to have His way in your life. Hope abounds when we are filled with the Holy Spirit of God because the Holy Spirit energizes our hope. If we find ourselves constantly filling our minds with all the news and all the social media of all the bad things happening in the world and just everything, so many people have no hope because of everything going on in the world. And it just, even, even, I mean, you just look at the world. It's getting worse and worse and worse. And it's going to keep getting worse and worse and worse because the Bible tells us, God tells us, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But that doesn't mean we have to live a life of hopelessness. It doesn't mean we have to live a life of being defeated. You and I, even in this sin-cursed world, even in a world that seems so contrary to God, you and I can still have joy and peace because we're walking with our Creator. We're walking with the one who's given us this life to enjoy. And you and I have a life to enjoy while we walk with our Savior. Again, it's the Holy Spirit inside of us. The Holy Spirit produces the joy and peace in our life. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 16, Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Romans 4, 14 tells us, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. God's not left us alone. There's times where you may feel like you're alone, even though you're surrounded by people, but if you're a child of God, you're not alone. You have the Holy Spirit of God in your life. God wants us to be reminded, to be filled with His Spirit. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 5, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I can only have true hope in Jesus Christ, and we can only abound in that hope if we allow ourselves 
to submit to what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. And the Holy Spirit always wants us to sing praises unto our Lord and Savior and thank Him for what He has done. And what He has done is paid the penalty for our sin. He has given us life through His resurrection and one day we'll see Him face to face. Look at Colossians as we close. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and you look at verse 27. In verse 27, the Bible says, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this ministry or mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is a wonderful thing to know that Jesus Christ dwells in you. You having the Holy Spirit of God, you being sealed by the Holy Spirit, you having Jesus Christ in your life, walking with you through this life, helping you to have the joy, helping you to realize, you know what, I can't do it without Jesus Christ. I can't live a life without Jesus Christ. Titus chapter 2 reminds us, looking for that blessed hope. You know, one day you and I will see Jesus Christ face to face. One day we'll see the one who died for us, the one who has helped us. You know, there's, there's days where you don't even, and I don't realize that God is holding us up and walking us through the day. I don't know if you've ever woken up in the morning and just felt like, I don't want to face today. I don't want to get out of the bed. Yesterday was a bad day, and I just don't want another day like that. But you find yourself going through the day anyway. Many times where God walks us and carries us through this life. Why? Because his desire is for us to finish the course that he's placed us on. Every one of us, sometimes the Bible calls it a race. Sometimes it's just the journey of life. But there's an end to all of this. And the end is standing before Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Seeing the one who loved you so much he stayed by your side, guiding you through this life. Christ in you, the hope of glory. We have something to look forward to. Admit, some days I don't look forward to the next day. But you know what? As Christ looked beyond the cross, he endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. Do you have something set before you that you can look to to get encouragement when you're faced with a bad day. I hope you do know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I hope that you do look towards Him unto the author and finisher of your faith who gives you the hope, the joy every day that helps you to face whatever you have to face. But aren't you glad that every day isn't filled with trials? Aren't you glad there are some good days? You're like, man, that was a good day. Focus on the good. Don't let the trials, don't let the bad days rob you of the joy of the Lord. Cast those at His feet. Cast your burdens upon the Lord, for He careth for you. Walk in the hope that He's given us. Walk in the victory that Jesus Christ has given us. And remember, beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear... We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you have that hope in you that you know he'll see you through it? You know that he's always there for you? I remember a time in Paul's life as we read in the scriptures that Paul and Silas got themselves thrown in prison. Not for committing a crime, not for doing anything wrong, but just for standing for their faith and helping people. And sometimes people just don't like your relationship with God. And Paul and Silas found themselves in prison right after being beaten. And we read in the scriptures that at midnight, midnight is the darkest hour of the night. Midnight is usually when minds are troubled, hearts are troubled, we can't sleep, we're tossing and turning, we're thinking of the bad things that happen, we're thinking of the what-ifs that are going to happen. 
And Paul and Silas give us a great example of what to do with the hope that we've been given. The Bible records that at midnight, Paul and Silas chose to sing, or chose to sing. Their backs are bleeding. They're fast in the stocks. There's no getting out. They have no idea what they intend to do with them. But they chose not to focus on the circumstance or the what ifs, but they chose to look unto the hills from whence cometh their help, because they knew their help comes from the Lord. And the Bible records that they started singing and started praying and just worshiping God and having their focus on Him instead of themselves and what they, the predicament they were in. And the Bible records that God caused an earthquake. I always like to look at the fact that God just chimed in with them with the bass note as they were singing, and God just kind of hit the bass note, and, and the Bible says the, the jail was shaken, the prison doors flung open, but nobody left. Nobody left because the Philippian jailer who was keeping guard woke up, and he saw the doors open, and he assumed all the prisoners escaped. And the Bible records that he drew out his own sword and was going to commit suicide and take his own life because he didn't want to have to face his commanders. Because the rule was, you lose your prisoners, you take their place. You take their place on the chopping block. Your life for theirs. But Paul cried out, do thyself no harm. And that unnamed man came springing into the prison cell falling down at Paul's feet asking, what must I do to have what you have? What must I do to have salvation? He had noticed there was a difference in them. He had heard their singing. He had heard their praying. At some point he fell asleep. But their testimony impacted his life. He had no hope in his life. But after that encounter after putting his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, because Paul would expound to him, he tells him about Jesus Christ, his life has changed. Now he had hope in his life. Now he had a reason to live. Maybe you've been faced at different times of not having a reason to live. In my own life, I was faced different times not having a reason to live until Jesus Christ came into my life and gave me a reason to live, and I realized, man, if I would have taken my life, I wouldn't be in the presence of the Lord. I wouldn't have any hope whatsoever. But because Jesus Christ stopped me, I have real hope. I have something to live for. Yeah, I still have bad days. But I have someone who wants me to cast all my care upon him. He wants to carry the load. He doesn't want me to carry the load. He wants me to abound in his hope. He wants me to abound in my faith. He wants me to abound in his love and to abound in faithfulness. He's the one that guides me through it. Somebody said this for hope. Hope is a powerful thing. Hope is like sunshine breaking through the clouds on a stormy day. Hope is like a breath of fresh air after being overcome by smoke. Hope is like hearing good news after a bad day. Hope is something we all need. And hope is something we all need.